My name is Brianna Bowling. I am the chairperson of CRMC, and I will be moderating today's session. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you experience any technical difficulties with the WebEx session, you can post your issue in the Q&A panel. During the presentation, all participants are going to be in listen-only mode, and as a reminder, the event is being recorded. For optimal viewing, be sure to change your view by going to the top right-hand side of your screen, hovering over the small circle, and choose side-by-side -side view rather than the video strip view. A video will be played during the webinar. If you are connected via phone, please be sure to turn up your computer speakers at the time of the video for best playback, as the audio from the video files will only come through your computer speakers. If you're connected by computer and cannot hear the video, check your audio settings on your computer. This is an interactive webinar, and we want your participation. We would encourage you to submit written questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A panel in the lower right of your screen. We will address questions during the Q&A session at the end, but don't hesitate to ask a question. The only dumb question is the one you didn't ask, and you're still wondering about at the end of the webinar. And I'm here to learn right alongside of you. There's a lot that I don't know either. We have a lot to cover in a very short period of time, so I'm gonna jump right in. So today we have Dr. Charity Dugan. Dr. Dugan is a breast surgeon at CRMC, and we also have Neela Taribio Straka, who is the Sisters at Heart co-director. So let's start with some questions for Dr. Charity Dugan. Dr. Dugan is board certified in general surgery, She's a fellow of the American College of Osteopathic Surgeons, and she specializes in breast health. But those are credentials. What really makes Dr. Dugan an asset to our community and to our hospital is her desire to get to know her patients on a personal level. A recent quote that I read from her really resonated with me. What she said was, I strive to have conversations with my patients so they feel connected to me as a provider. And that is so important to all of your patients. So thank you, Dr. Dugan, and thank you for joining us today to answer our questions about breast health. So let's start with a really, really basic question. And that is, you know, like all cancers, prevention and early detection are very critical. So people who are watching, maybe they have a family history of breast cancer and they're worried about getting breast cancer too. So what can they do at home before they ever see a doctor? I think you can't you can't talk about any kind of medical condition without just thinking about health as a whole. So of course I'm going to give the stock answer of an active, healthy lifestyle. So mm -hmm. exercise, regular exercise is important. Eating healthy is important. We all have our vices. So me too, and my patients know that. <laughs> um, speaking specifically to breast cancer, which is why we're here today, um, what you can do at home is start with your self exam. Monthly, you need to do a, a personal self-exam. You have to make contact with your fingertips on each side of your chest. Um, I always explain how to do the exam in my office to my patients, and the full uh, anatomical borders, as we refer to it as the breast, is from the collarbone all the way under to where the bra sits in that fold under your breast, from the breastbone all the way outside under the armpit. Um, you also have to include feeling in the axilla, uh, during your monthly exam and above and below that collarbone because we have lymph nodes along the breastbone, along the collarbone, and into the axilla. Um, some patients will find a mass that's concerning that's a lymph node before they'll find a breast cancer. Um, hmm. So start first with your, your at-home exam. Okay, and then what happens if they're doing their breast exam and they actually find something, or at least they think they found something? Like, so what should they be looking for when they're doing that breast exam? And if they do find something that concerns them, what should they do? Okay, so first, when you do the exam, of course, I told you where, but how. A good way I, I will also advise is to look in the mirror, um, put your hands on your hips, lean forward, lean back. And what you're looking for there is a change in the breast skin. Um, mm -hmm. Cancer sort of tethers itself to whatever else is around it. That's why it grows and invades. So when you lean forward or lean back, you may see a dimpling or a change in the breast skin that you wouldn't notice if you didn't change position. So that's why we say do them in front of the mirror. So you're not just uh, feeling, you're also visually inspecting. 
Um, other things we look for and I advise my patients to look for at home on self-exam is changes in the nipple, either in inversion or the nipple may point to one direction or the other, up, down, right, left, it happens. Um, and really, I tell patients, because so many women say, I have lumpy breasts, I just don't do an exam. I say, understand, most people are lumpy <laughs> and asymmetrical, <laughs> but what you're really feeling for is something that's on one side that's not on the other and doesn't go away. So some people get carried away and do the breast exam every day. I also advise against that, because your anxiety goes through the roof and you drive yourself crazy. So I, I talk to women that are premenopausal, um, the best time to do your breast, your self breast exam is one week after menstruation ends. And postmenopausal, I say pick a day, one to 28 on the calendar, put it in your little smartphone and let it ding at you and do it um, once a month. And, and for patients that are pretty knowledgeable uh, about what, you know, what I'm talking about, I'll say journal it. You know, we look at each breast as a clock, 12 to 12. And so I'll say if you feel something at three o'clock, four centimeters from the nipple, um, you write it down. What does it feel like? Does it feel like a grape, a BB, a marble? Is it soft, hard? Does it move up and down, right and left? Or does it just stay there? Um, and certain features are more concerning. Non-mobile is, is more concerning. More firm is more concerning. But just because that's more concerning doesn't mean it's cancer. Everybody's breast is different. So um, I'll tell them to journal that and then wait one whole month until the next cycle and see if it's still there. Because a lot of times it can be a cyst or um, something that kind of swells and then goes down with, with hormonal cycles. Um, and I always say if it's still there, if it's the same size, if it gets bigger, that's concerning. But if it was there yesterday and it isn't there tomorrow, that can't be cancer <laughs> because <laughs> cancer doesn't go away. It grows and it flourishes and it takes over. Good. Yeah, I'm really glad that you, you addressed the mental health aspect of this because it can be very concerning to people who are, you know, doing their, their screenings. So speaking yeah. of the mental health, um, do you think that because of the coronavirus pandemic that there's been an increase in women delaying their breast health screenings like their mammograms? And, and yeah. how risky is that? Of course, it, it's so risky. I don't have a percentage to tell you, but it is. I'm a board certified general surgeon, so I pull general surgery call at the hospital in addition to my breast health practice here in La Plata. So what we're seeing is a rise in general of things um, being more grave than they need to be. Appendicitis is worse, diverticulitis is worse. Um, and now breast cancer diagnoses and colon cancer diagnoses are delayed and worse. Um, so you're missing out on the opportunity for us to find it early and treat it with the most minimally invasive options. Um, screening is your first step to, you know, prevention and a cure. So you, you have to keep up with that. First and foremost, colonoscopies, mammograms are, are important because those are your two cancers you can cure if you catch them early. Okay. And, and if someone has delayed a screening, I mean, they shouldn't feel bad about it. They should just make the appointment no. and come in. No, I mean, I'm so sorry. I'm not trying to shame anyone. Yeah. But I just want everyone <laughs> no. to understand the importance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's been a lot of fear, and so some people may have delayed it, and, and people get that, and you just need to just start anew. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. We, we, we've discussed it at the, at the hospital on staff, and, and there's research about it. If there's a place to go during the pandemic, everybody thinks, no, not the hospital, but when you're talking about your health, you have to go to the hospital, and we actually are the safest place to go, argumentatively, right. because we have the protective gear, we don't go from patient to patient's room and wear the same things. I mean, we have all these preventative practices in place so that patients don't have to have that fear, but they just don't know. I mean, right. I'm, I'm a mother and a wife, and my husband is not in healthcare, and so it's the same thing coming to my house. Like, I'm scared for my kids to go places. So it's not just patients. It's just this is where I work. So right. I know what I'm doing here, but I don't know what they're doing in the shopping centers. You know what I mean? Right. No, you're 100% right. The hospitals do a great job, and our hospital in particular does a great job of protecting our patients. So that's great to know. Um, so let's say that um, someone does is diagnosed with cancer. So at what point dur during that cancer, I'm going to call it the cancer journey, do they typically meet with you? It is truly a journey, and a lot of times that journey starts with me. So sometimes okay. I'm the, the bearer of the bad news. And some, but I would say so far here, I've been practicing in La Plata since July. And um, 
I want to say most of my, my referrals, my new patients are coming after diagnosis. So, so still very early, um, but knowing that they're coming to me scared and, and uncomfortable with something new. Um, so I'm that first, like, this is what you have. It is cancer. And it's usually like an hour long conversation where I throw a ton of information at a person and all they really hear is the C word. And I get it. And I know it. I've been doing this for 10 years. Like I, I know that's what it is. And we'll have the same conversation in a week when we do the surgery and we'll have the same conversation in two weeks when we do the post-op and we'll have the same conversation again after you meet with your oncologist <laughs> and you wonder, are they really doing the right thing, Dr. Dugan? Because by then we've already built this relationship of trust where I put them to sleep, I've cut on them and they, they, they're like, what do you think? And I'm like, no, no, trust the oncologist. That's why I sent you there. <laughs> right. <laughs> So you touched on that a little bit and, and, you know, and what happens when somebody comes in for an appointment just right now, and that's great. But um, can you tell me a little bit about the, some of the different breast health services that are at the medical pavilion that CRMC offers? Yeah, so in our in our medical pavilion building, in my office, I'm the, I'm the breast surgeon in my office. So at my office specifically, I see patients for both benign and malignant concerns, that cancer and non-cancerous things, because there's a lot that happens in the breast that's not cancer but it's the C word that scares us and which drives mm-hmm. people in a lot of times. But there's also breast pain related to uh, cysts and menstrual cycles. I mean, there's just a lot. So first of all, we go, we do a comprehensive history of your, of your other medical comorbidities, your other medical problems. What medications are you taking? How could those be affecting your overall health and well-being? And uh, also supplements. Some supplements can help and or hinder what you're going for as far as quality of life. And then um, history also pertaining to family history because it's a huge newish um, thing out there is genetic counseling. So we don't have genetic counseling here at the center, but um, I refer to the Greenbaum Comprehensive Cancer Center mm-hmm. in Baltimore. Jessica Scott is one of the um, certified genetic counselors up there and I've touched base with her since I got here because that is an important part of my practice to do to really make patients understand what it means that you've had three, four, or even just one, your mom, a uh, family member with breast cancer. Um, not all breast cancers are hereditary, okay? But some are, and some are that we don't know yet because we all, well, I'm gonna say we all, we all in medicine, but not everybody out there. Uh, the most common gene is the BRCA, BRCA1 and 2, Genetic right. mutations are the ones we test for uh, mostly, but, you know, there's constant research being done, and especially in breast cancer because the sample size is so huge. So we're, we're, there are more mutations that we know about now, and they, I don't know many people that are heavily involved in, in breast cancer treatment or breast health uh, in general that only test for BRCA anymore, especially if you tell me, you have a family history of colon cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer. We found syndromes that across the board can involve multiple different organs and they can be on the same gene. And sometimes we find genetic mutations that we call it of uncertain significance. Um, And then we have to decide between me and the genetic counselor, what is the next step? What are our recommendations based on those things? So in addition to the whole history taking at the pavilion with me, a comprehensive breast exam, a clinical breast exam, and then, of course, education, like we talked about in the first question of how you should be checking your own breast. What, what is your own personal, you know, patient responsibility with, with me, with you and your primary care doctor? Um, but once the patient establishes me, I, I always tell them to go back to the primary care doctor. I always make sure your primary care manager knows what's going on with your body and your life because you have other things that are going on that I'm not going to be the primary person treating, but check with them, make sure anything I'm recommending isn't conflicting with what they think you need to do. And if there's a problem, we talk, but mostly um, once they're established with me, they're my patient. So I always tell them, now you're mine. You'll see me every year. And um, if you if something new comes up in six months on your self-exam, don't wait until you see me in a year. Call me and I'll either see you sooner. We'll get new imaging or come up with a plan. Um, in addition to my office in the pavilion, there's the, the Charles Regional Imaging Center, the Outpatient Imaging Center right next to me, which is huge convenience 
for me and the patient because the mammograms, ultrasounds, image guided biopsies of the breast, everything can be done there, um, coordinated between my office and, and right next door. And that actually brings up another point. You, you had mentioned the Greenbaum um, Cancer Center. And so Greenbaum is actually part of the University of Maryland medical system. Mm-hmm. And so it's all, you know, we're one system. And so we're very fortunate to have a really world-class facility available to us. So that, just to mention, that is part of our system. Yes. Um, and you mentioned some of the, the changes in, in, you know, the breast cancer prevention and treatments. But can you kind of just kind of extend that question in terms of what actually has changed over the years if somebody was treated for breast cancer five years ago, 10 years ago, what's changed since then in terms of prevention and treatment? I would say, you know, uh, gosh, 10 years ago, I was still in residency. So I was still um, <laughs> exposed to a lot of different things. I did some training in breast um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. I did some training in breast at Washington Hospital Center in DC. So I got to see a, different, a lot of different approaches, but I would say, Five to ten years ago to now, not a ton has changed except for that we, we're getting like more minimally invasive, we call it. And that's just mm. we're we're getting more technologically advanced to where we can um isolate the tumor and I would say we used to do uh mastectomies for everyone, right? But that's more than ten years ago. Now we're doing more breast conservation. Um and where we would once upon a time maybe do a quadrantectomy, which is removing a quarter of the breast, with all the research, we know uh, the margins have gone from you need this, I'm trying to get in the screen, this much uh, free, <laughs> clear margin to this, 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 this. So uh, I I, okay. talk, I um, often have conversations with my patients because there's, just, there's different kinds of cancers. There's invasive and there's in situ and it's going to be getting over the head of most people. But most of the time with invasive cancer, well, it is all the time with invasive breast cancer, you just have to have a clear margin. That can be a millimeter or it can be two centimeters. So okay. that's a, that's an advancement and a change that you don't have to have, like in colon cancer, you want five centimeters. You know, okay. um, then in addition to that, just technologically, a new, a new advancement um, that we're, that I'm bringing to Charles Regional is the, it's a magnetic uh, localization procedure called the MAG seed, and it's made by the, uh, the company Mammatome, and there's different ways you can do this, but this is a magnet, basically. So anybody that's had a breast biopsy, uh, a minimally invasive one with a, with a needle that gets the column of tissue and tests positive for a cancer, that's usually when they come see me. Then it's my decision of how am I going to remove this? Can I feel it or can't I feel it? If I can't feel it, then I need a localization procedure because I don't have x-ray vision. So right. the new, the newer um, approaches are switching from the, the old long wire that you have to go the same day of the surgery and have the wire placed and it hangs out of the breast. And it's just kind of an uncomfortable. A lot of patients are like, wow, this big extra thing hanging on me until surgery. And it's all the same day. And we do still have to do that for certain cases and everything's patient independent. But um, the magnetic seed is simply placing that in the center of the tumor, for lack of a better understanding. But it's a, it's a way to map where I'm going to excise. And then I use a special magnetic sensing wand to determine the distance from that magnet. And so okay. I go over these images with the breast radiologist, and we, um, we can determine what distances we need to take on all sides based on the position of the magnet and how it how it shows up on the mammogram. So that's one in advance um, from prior, I would say. Um, okay. Right. That's great. I mean, that, that pretty much wraps up most of our questions. And I just want to thank you. I think, you know, our community is very fortunate to have with your expertise and your very compassionate care. So I, I thank you for that. Um, and if you could stay for the viewer questions at the end, we'd very much appreciate that because I expect we will have some. And, and as a reminder, if you have any questions, both on what Dr. Dugan said or anything in particular that you're particularly worried about, please post your questions and we will answer them. So um, I'm going to move on. High quality care is important. And Dr. Dugan, I said, and her team are certainly ready and able to provide it. But beating breast cancer and educating people about the disease, it requires a whole community of support and resources. And that's where our next guest comes in. 
So next we have Neela Taribia Straka. She is the co-director of Sisters at Heart, which is a breast cancer support group in Southern Maryland. Neela herself is a 14-year breast cancer survivor and previously was the external affairs coordinator for the Side Out Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that raises funds to support breast cancer research and education of youth through the sport of volleyball. So welcome, Neela. Thank sure. you. Oh, good, you can hear it, great. Um, so as you know, anybody who's diagnosed with breast cancer, they're gonna have all types of fear and uncertainty. So what does the Sisters of Heart say to women and men who have received this diagnosis during the pandemic? Well, first I wanna say thank you, Dr. Dugan, for coming on board and we're very happy to have you in our community. Um, and Brianna, thank you for hosting us today as well. This the disease of breast cancer, as we all know, it just doesn't stop because the world seemingly stops because of COVID. And as an organization of breast cancer survivors, I think we have a little bit more knowledge of what it feels like to go through the world of being diagnosed with breast cancer. And having to feel isolated and alone just with the diagnosis of cancer is exemplified even more with the COVID. Um, these last couple of months, I've probably fielded about four or five phone calls from um, women who have been newly diagnosed with breast cancer and just seeking the information and having us be able to communicate with them and share our story seems to ease the anxiety that women and men have to go through. It's been very rewarding for me over the years and even in my um, other uh, job as we uh, were working with Side Out, I got to travel the country to meet women uh, and listen to their stories. And some of them are very reluctant. Uh, as you were, uh, you were talking about getting out there to get diagnosed and getting treatment. And, and with the COVID, these women now that I've spoken to are even more afraid to get out there. So some of the advice I've been giving them is one, do some research, but don't over-research because it's an overreaction that happens with, um, you know, you mentioned the C-word. I remember myself having been diagnosed and I went on to the computer and it's like, whoa, it's, it's so overwhelming. And I think that the research that needs to be done in conjunction with COVID is more of what is the protocol that is at a doctor's office? What is the protocol at the hospital and how can I see treatment and have the faith that everything's going to be okay? That's great. So can you tell me a little about the Sisters of Heart and, and how does the Sisters of Heart help cancer, uh, people who have been diagnosed with cancer? Well, in 2007, um, I met Roberta Keelinger, who uh, was the founder and sort of the, the guru behind Sisters at Heart. And it started as just an awareness group to support for men and women. We um, are a bunch of totally volunteers and uh, survivors that try to make a difference in our community as to helping people who have been diagnosed. We do a lot of things through um, awareness, education. We've been in the high schools to uh, try to do different seminars similar like what we're doing today. And then we also do some fundraising where we can offer grants to our local hospitals and also some other community-based um, charities and organizations that then can help women get free screening with breast cancer diagnosis. That's great. So, um, you know, so you said it's been around for 13 years, and during that 13 years, you've established partnerships with lots of community organizations. Um, can you tell us a little about those partnerships? Yeah, since speaking with Roberta, um, we kind of escalated our fundraising component where we helped to raise some money. Uh, we are now in the, it started out as just being the Sisters at Heart of Charles County, and we've expanded to Southern Maryland. We work with the three main hospitals in our tri-county area, Charles Regional, Albert Memorial, St. Mary's Hospital. And then one of our big affiliates is the health partners in Waldorf. We also have established a contact with the College of Southern Maryland. And like I was telling you, the local high schools in our area. Over the last 13 years, we've raised about $150,000 to help expand the breast care um, health care services for those who may not have insurance or just may need some extra help from a doctor, maybe some extra help in the home. 
and um, also with outreach materials for um, our community. Great. Okay. So, um, I, I like every organization right now, um, fundraising is super important to your organization and to lots of every, pretty much every nonprofit out there. Um, and it's, the pandemic has drastically changed how we do fundraise. But despite that, you just completed a very successful fundraiser. So, could you tell me a little bit about that fundraiser and how it went? Right, that's correct. Um, we usually hold an annual block, breast cancer block, at the Women's Green and Indian Pet. And last year we had over 250 participants. Um, and then this year, of course, because of the pandemic, we've gone totally viral. And it's our first time, and I'll tell you to do something viral and be able to reach out now, not just to our community, but to see the support we've gotten on a national level through our friends and all. We've, we've added this thing called the Walk Plus, and um, we've extended it for a whole week. So we still have a couple more days and so people can still make donations, but it's doing an activity anywhere, like walking, running, biking, uh, hiking, anywhere in your home, your neighborhood, at any time of the day that you want. And just to register, it's about $25, or you can make a donation if you would like as well. Awesome. So can people still sign up? Yeah. As I was telling you, we're, we're sending till the 24th, which is Saturday. Um, you can go on the Sisters at Heart Breast Cancer uh, Support Group, uh, our Facebook page, or you can go to runsignup.com and then search for Sisters at Heart. Great. So every little bit will help. So please try to see if you can do that for us. Wonderful. And do you participate in any other events? Well, we actually, the month of October has been so peppered in the past with us being in a gymnasium, um, our volleyball community. I brought that into our community here where they have raised money and we've done that. But one of our biggest fundraisers that had to be canceled in April was the Breast Cancer in April Poker Run. Um, and last year we raised over $12,000 with that. So that's a big hit for us. But our walk has taken the place and and help us to maintain that. We also do some community activities, such as decorating the Christmas tree for the Tree of Life at the hospital. It's a big 30-foot tree that will be in the lobby, and we're planning to do that as well. We try to support our people through cards and those who've been recently diagnosed and gone through surgery with comfort pillows that um, one of our uh, volunteers made for us. And then the other thing that we established after Roberta's passing was the Roberta King versus the Vet Heart um, Scholarship. It's endowed, and we annually award that to two students at CSN who are pursuing a career in our healthcare. So we're hoping that one day one of these young people are going to get some better to help on this business. Right. Yeah, so what I have prepared is a little slide presentation, so that I'd like to share that with you now. Um, so you can see some of the things we've done in the last 13 years. Excellent. hear me again. So thank you, Neela. That was a great presentation, and I'm really glad that we, we have the Sisters of Heart to help us. So thank you very much. So now we're going to open the floor to questions. Um, if you have not asked a question yet, but if you think of one while we're answering the others, feel free to ask. Um, and these can be addressed to either Dr. Dugan or to, to Neela, either one. 
So the first question I have, I guess this is more probably to Dr. Dugan, but um, what are the best ways that someone can prevent breast cancer so they never ever have to even come see you um, and to reduce their risk? Uh, Dr. Dugan, I don't think we can hear you. Got it. Oh, there you go. Great. I can hear you now. Thank you. <laughs> Myself. Um, so, so prevention, like we talked about before, of course, an active, healthy lifestyle. Smoking is bad for all cancers, breast included. It causes, it can cause breast cancer. Um, doing your self breast exam every month, ensuring that um, from puberty on, really, to get an annual clinical breast exam. So that's a breast exam by a, a practitioner. And then, you know, we get into the weeds. But a prophylactic mastectomy is a hot topic. A lot of people want to talk about it. That is not 100% reduction, though. And I'll always come Sorry, what is that? You, you said everybody wants to talk about it, but I don't know what yeah. that is. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so prophylactic is prevention, and a mastectomy is removing the breast. So a, okay. lot, a lot of women, you know, will ask me, what about that? Do you think I should do that? And, and these are specifically coming up with uh, patients that have the family history or – even sometimes patients that have had cancer on one side or even just a cancer scare on one side and they want to address the other side. Um, but prophylactic mastectomy is preventative breast removal surgery. And I do those. Um, insurance pays for it. But okay. um, I always make sure to tell patients, I mean, a, a huge part of a trusting relationship is being transparent. And 100% mm -hmm. transparency is a preventative mastectomy is not 100% reduction um, of risk. So it's a, it's a 90 plus percent reduction of risk because we're removing 90 plus percent of the breast tissue. But what patients don't understand is to leave the skin intact, I have to leave some microscopic breast cells under the skin so that the skin can stay alive and receive the blood flow and everything that needs to not, you know, die on the chest because you have to have skin. Um, yeah. So that is, that is, um, you know, probably the greatest, most dramatic risk uh, averse thing that you can do is a mastectomy. But I think overall, it's it's keeping an active, healthy lifestyle, educating yourself, doing yourself, your monthly self exams, getting an annual clinical breast exam. And then one thing a lot of patients will talk to me is about hormone, hormone exposure in general, like, should I take what the doctor gives me when I go through menopause? Mm. It is a personal decision. You know, it depends on if the side effects of what you have going through menopause are enough for you to need medication, then it might be enough that you need to take that medication. But there are patients that have, ten, that have taken hormone replacement for 10 years, and they say, why did I get this? And I say, I don't know. I'm not God. That's me. But right. I, that's my answer. Right. But, but I do say the only thing we see in your history is that you did take this for quite a bit of time. Another thing is birth control pills. I'm not going to tell anybody how to live their life one way or the other. If you need it, you need it. And you have to, you have to make the personal decision, you know, of what, what works for you. And so birth control is, is uh, a, not just a prevention, but a treatment for a lot of things, acne, painful periods. Um, and also patients don't understand that there's hormone release from the IUD, from the next one on implant in the arm, from the patch, from the shot. Those are all hormones, not just the birth control. Right. You know, so any kind of exposure to hormones, that's another question I usually ask in my um, comprehensive history, just because I'm trying to rate how how much at risk is this patient for developing breast cancer in the future if, if they're not already coming to me with cancer. Okay. Yeah, like anything, I guess there's risks and benefits to everything that we're doing. So. Right. <laughs> Um, so we have a couple more questions. Um, the first one is, does having lymph nodes removed affect your immune system? Yeah, I saw that one pop up. That's a good question. I, no one's ever asked me that. But hey, <laughs> what smart <laughs> participants we have. Yay. Uh, so the, the short answer is, could it? Of course, because I'm removing a lymph node, right? But let's, that's another quote-unquote advancement um, that we were sort of touching on prior used to be that an axillary lymph node dissection, which is removing all of the lymph nodes in the underarm, was a standard of practice for basically clearing out the main area where the breast tissue drains. And when we talk about breast tissue draining, we're talking about lymphatic fluid. And this is, you know, getting kind of anatomic and heavy. But you talk about cancer, we worry about cancer spreading. Well, most cancers spread through the lymphatic system. 
So that's why we talk about cancer going to the lymph nodes. So when you're having your initial surgery, if you're doing breast conservation, which is a lumpectomy or a partial mastectomy, um, I also will do something called a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And in that surgery, the goal is really just to remove one lymph node, the first lymph node that the cancer would have moved to if it's invading the, trying to invade the rest of your body. Um, that being said, sometimes in my sentinel node procedure, I may remove more than one lymph node because we use different kind of uh, tracers, and tracers are dyes. One is radioactive. Um, one is actually visibly blue. And then I'll also feel, are there any bulky, uh, large, enlarged lymph nodes that I can feel? If, if any of those signals or, or if I can palpate something and I know it's a lymph node, I usually will remove more than one because the point of that procedure is a staging procedure, which is me telling you how advanced your cancer is. Is it only in the breast? Is it is it moving into the lymph nodes? And we stage a breast cancer based on how many lymph nodes are involved. So oh. um, I like to get more than one because if I can tell you only one of two are positive, then that makes me feel more reassured. And I think it helps the patients and the oncologist too. Um, and then axillary lymph node dissection will remove like 20 lymph nodes. So that's removing all the lymph nodes. It's like this whole fatty pocket that you can feel when you reach up there under your arm underarm and I tell you to check that area too. It's it's removing most of the lymph nodes in that area. So if you think about could that affect my immune system? Yes, because I'm taking Okay. I just actually disappeared. I'm sorry. I don't know oh, what no, that's okay. <laughs> I can see you. Great. I completely disappeared from it. So I'm glad you kept going. <laughs> okay. okay, good. Great. I was, just, I was just answering that when we do the axillary lymph node dissection, we remove that whole area under your under your arm and that's sometimes twenty lymph nodes, you know. So of course, you can imagine removing 20 versus one or two is going has the greater potential to affect how your immune system works. But really, the the short answer is it's not going to affect you as a whole because okay. we have lymph nodes throughout the body. So, and we're not removing every single one. But of course, the complication of lymph node removal or the risk is lymphedema. And so we take out that area that potentially drains not just that breast, but also that upper extremity on that side. And that's how you can get the, the global swelling in that, that arm, which doesn't happen as much anymore, probably because we're not doing as many axillary lymph node dissections, but there's also different energy devices that we can use in the operating room that decrease. Um, I'm sorry, what's an energy function. device? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the energy devices like cautery or burning. Um, oh, okay. I, I use an ultrasonic cauterizer called harmonic scalpel when I do my lymph node procedures in the arm and uh, in, I say in the armpit because I'm so used to talking just layman but in the underarm and the axilla <laughs> um, and I, I started using that also back in residency um, and there was some research that that said that it could decrease the risk of lymphedema and I've only had a few patients that have had you know true lymphedema which is big swelling of the extremity on the same side as the, the lymph node removal. Okay, great. We have another question. Um, what questions are important to ask my doctor after a recent diagnosis about my treatment plan? And I love this question. I think it's so relevant because, like you said, they, they come in, they got the big eyes, and they're just like, oh, my gosh, cancer. So what is the list that they should bring in to talk to their doctor about? I know. I know this question. <laughs> You might love this question. I really hate this question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> From this side, it's an important question. It's, of course. I think I hate it because I'm going to throw so much information at the patient that I I don't know. I'm going to try to touch on all the questions. So what, mm. your doc, what I'm going to say is I'm going to reframe it. What your doctor should be telling you versus all what right. you have to ask. Because you shouldn't have to be pulling information out from your doctor. You, I should be telling you this is what you have. This is what this means. This is what we're going to do with it. This is how you're going to be okay. That's what you should be getting from your surgeon, from your oncologist, from your doctor. And in the same light, if it's not okay, still, what are we going to do with, with this? And how are we going to approach it? Because even some cancers are advanced. And not all cancers are amenable to surgery, necessarily. Um, you know, and we have to have those hard conversations, too. But the information that you should be getting of course, is what type of cancer do I have? Uh, is it invasive? 
Okay, invasive means malignant, means is it cancer that's trying to spread? Is it spread? Is it metastatic? Um, you don't know. How do you know that? You know, um, what stage is it? And that's always the question when they come to me, but we have actually three different, well, I'll say two different stages in uh, cl staging times. We call it clinical staging, which is before surgery. So that's just based on your imaging and okay. what we know clinically, like what I feel and what I see. That's the clinical stage. And so it may look like it's two centimeters on the mammogram, but then we do surgery and it's three centimeters. So then your pathologic stage, which the pathologist is the microscope doctor, the one that I send all the tissue to after we remove it in the surgery, and they look at everything under the microscope, and that's your pathologic stage. And that's your true stage, um, and your stage matters because that's what helps the oncologist decide where are you at and what do we need to throw at it to help you okay. get through it. I was just getting ready to ask you why it mattered, and you just yes. you got it. Right. <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> um, and then staging, after staging, what are my options, right? I'm the patient, and you don't know everything that I know. What can you do for me? I mean, that's that's what you really got. That's what you're there. What can you do for me? Why am I here? You know, do I have to have my whole breast removed? What happens if I don't? What's the difference in having a mastectomy? What is a mastectomy? So that's like so many patients, when I educate them on the whole area of what you're examining or what you're supposed to be examining when you do that for your self-exam, that's what we remove in a mastectomy, from the collarbone down to under your breast, from the breastbone to under your axilla. And patients are like, wow, I didn't realize it was that much. It is. It's not just the part that hangs out and hangs down. It's mm. everything because there's right. breast cells in all that area. So, you know, it's a greater surgery. It takes more time on the table. You know, what are what are my risks when I'm in surgery that aren't even related to what I'm doing? You know, you still yeah. have to be under general anesthesia, which means you're paralyzed and the machine is breathing for you while we're doing that. Um, so your risk for all complications, heart attack, stroke, all that stuff goes up. These are all things people don't think about, but it's true, and we have to think about it because you're trusting us. Um, and then what happens after surgery? You know, a lot of times I don't refer my patients to the oncologist until I am done doing the surgery part because sometimes, especially if we do lumpectomy, which is the partial mastectomy, you may not have those clear margins, and we might have to go back again. So the oncologist doesn't want to treat you until we're done with the surgery because if we haven't eliminated the cancer as much as we can physically, then, you know, their treatment isn't going to work because the research is based on, you know, the partnership of the systemic treatment and the surgical treatment. Okay. So assuming that somebody has gotten a diagnosis or a treatment plan or both, um, how important is it for them to get a second opinion, or should they at all? Is that even an important thing to do? I think it's important if it's what you think you need. You know, I I have not had breast cancer. Mm. I don't have anybody in my family that has had breast cancer. But I've held many a hand of a patient going through breast cancer and dying of breast cancer, and patients that have held the hands of their loved ones dying of breast cancer. So... I just, I can, I, I can identify from that. I can really right. sympathize. Um, so if you need three people to tell you that this is the right thing to do, then I'm going to say, do it. And if you right. ask my family, they would say, yeah, that's what Charity is going to say. Because I ask three people their opinions, and I can do nothing of what the three people told me. But, <laughs> right. but you, you have to do what prepares you for the fight. Um, because I tell my patients, just like you referred to it, this is a journey. And most of my patients, because they're early, early detected and not advanced, I often will say in a year, this will be all over and we'll be on the other side of this and your outlook will be so different. Right. Um, but sometimes you need different opinions and sometimes you just have to hear it more than once. Sometimes you need to go to Dr. Google for a consult, <laughs> you know, right. another thing that doctors hate, but. We understand, right. you know. So. Right. No, and it is. It's, it's not just a medical diagnosis. We also have to worry about, you know, the mental aspect of this. And so I, I think those are all great suggestions. So mm -hmm. I, if we don't have any other questions, actually, this actually concludes the Q&A session. 
Um, but, you know, of course, you can always reach out to Dr. Dugan or uh, Neela anytime with any of these questions later, too. Um, so if you are battling breast cancer or if you have a friend or a loved one who is, I, I'm hoping that this webinar has answered a lot of your questions and addressed some of your concerns, at least. But there is one last thing. If you have this disease or you're a caregiver for someone who does, you need to know that you are not alone in your journey. And we want to leave you today with a pair of survivor stories so you know that you can win this battle. So if you could play the video, that would be great. At age 45, I wasn't going to get mammograms done. When my younger sister died of cancer at age 47, I started going. I advise everyone to go get their mammograms done. Please get your health checked and get your mammograms done. We are fortunate to be in a place where there is affordable health care, so there is no excuse. Prevention is better than cure. It's better not to be surprised. Knowledge is power. In uh, 2004, I detected what I thought was a mosquito bite or boil on my right breast. After several applications of Neosporin, which Neosporin is my go-to medication ointment, it did not go away. I then called my primary care physician who asked me to go for my mammogram. After the mammogram, sonogram was done only to confirm that there is a detection of breast cancer. You can imagine my shock. I did not think it would be me. As a licensed nutritionist, I ate the right food, never smoked, nor did anyone in my family, did my exercise and everything. So this is why I'm emphasizing, go get your mammograms done. Fortunately, when biopsy was done, it had not spread to my lymph node. So the surgeon prescribed chemotherapy followed by radiation. This was after lumpectomy. They did lumpectomy. After this, I had to take five years of oral medication of Arimidic. Thanks to the support of my friends, relatives, and the faith in God, because this was not easy. It was a big shock. Now I have been cancer-free for 15 year, years. I joined the Sisters at Heart Association as my support group, and I have been a member for nine years. Thank you to God, thank you to my friends, and I hope you all will once again go get your mammogram done. Hi. Um I have the privilege to present their next survivor story, and I wanted to thank Doris from our sister center for her sharing her journey. Um, our next survivor story is Mary Rigney. She is a 16-year survivor and was born and raised in England. She later became a nurse, and after her marriage, she and her husband moved to the United States, where she continued to work as a nurse until she retired. She has a daughter, a son, and seven grandchildren. So here's Mary's story. My name is Mary Rigney. I've been cancer survivor for 16 years. I first encountered cancer uh, with discovered in my right breast following a routine mammogram in 2005. After that thought, I decided to do a lumpectomy and radiation. In 2014, I discovered in my left breast a possible mass. Following a visit to my surgeon, uh, it was stage two with lymph nodes involved. This time, I elected to do only radiation, and it's been five years since my last episode. My advice to anyone having to go through this is to get lots of support and not to dwell constantly on it. I think it tends to get 
people more stress than they can handle. Try to remain grateful to the doctors and be mindful of the advances made in medicine, since both are in your corner backing you in this fight. And those are the words from Mary. And, um, thank her. I would like to thank her and everyone else here on our staff, um, as well as Dr. Begin again. Thank you very, very much. That is all the time we have today. Thank you, Dr. Dugan. Thank you, Neela. And thank you, all of our participants, for participating in our webinar today. I'm Brianna Bowling, and please reach out to Dr. Dugan and to the Sisters at Heart if you need their care and support, because you are not alone. <laughs>